Welcome to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, presented by Cooper Tires and our friends, the Justice Brothers, makers of fine additives, cleaners, and lubricants for the automotive, heavy equipment, agricultural, and industrial worlds. This episode, we have another pal of ours, Jim Busby, amazing driver, even more amazing team owner, possibly, from IMSA's glory years in the 70s and 80s. We have a separate piece on his win 30 years back on the 1989 24 Hours of Daytona, with a couple of different voices in there that I hope you'll enjoy. This piece goes back even further, and I figured with NBC and NBC Sports coming in as IMSA's brand new exclusive television partner, and also knowing that NBC was really uh, among those at the forefront of bringing in-car technology, at least in the United States, to us in the early 80s, 83, 84, I believe, Uh, we know that in 1985... With Jim Busby's BF Goodrich sponsored uh, dual entries with Porsche 962s, we went along for rides with Jim, with Bob Wallach, with all the drivers, a part of that awesome team using in-car cameras for the very first time in IMSA. So we figured, hey, let's go back a bit, talk with Jim about this experience, about some of the general promotions that went on with BF Goodrich. They did some very pioneering things back then outside of the cockpit as well to utilize this footage which we get into Jim's a master storyteller wanders all over the place I love that Uh, so you get bits and pieces of the in-car camera story and others woven in we also have a piece here that thankfully uh, after spending a lot of money uh, far too long ago to get just about every issue of the old IMSA Aero magazine, uh, the official publication of the series back in the day, happened upon this great story I'd forgotten about on the introduction of in-car cameras, and there's a great quote in there uh, about Jim uh, being a little hardcore on track and maybe taking someone out while not realizing that, hey buddy, you're being filmed now, live, for the first time. Uh, something that back in the day you could get away with. Uh, hey, there's no nothing here, nothing in terms of incriminating material. Well, <laughs> as he explains, there's a bit of a revelation that, oops, Big Brother's looking over my shoulder. Pretty interesting, too, to know that this original system, uh, with not just the camera and the cockpit, but all the other associated bits, weighed somewhere around 14 to 15 pounds. And for what we have today, for essentially... The same exact thing, albeit in full HD and everything downsized. All the equipment necessary is about four pounds or so. So big evolution there in downsizing, but figure you're going to see tons of in-car this weekend at the Rolex 24 at Daytona, courtesy of NBC. So why not go back to where in-car footage got its start in 1985 with Jim Busby and the Busby Racing Team, all presented to you here by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers. Being at the forefront in 1985 of IMSA's in-car camera revolution. Yeah, oh and my god. With NBC <laughs> and NBC Sports taking over the new contract here with IMSA, we saw that yep. about a year or two ago in IndyCar, uh, yep. the good folks at NBC Sports and IMS Productions had uh, come up with a really nice HD helmet cam, which really moved mm-hmm. oh, the yeah. ball forward. But if we're looking back to, at least on the sports car side, those white BF Goodrich 962s of yours from 1985 broke new ground with bringing the, uh, the inside the cockpit experience to yes. the world. How did that come together? How did the conversation start? It, it was BF Goodrich. You, you can say what you want about B.F. Goodrich in the early days of all this stuff when they were independent and not owned by Michelin. Bottom line is, is Gary Pace and Chuck Patrick in engineering and some of the key players at B.F. Goodrich had the balls to come into big-time racing with big-time tires and not look back, and they pulled it off. Not only were they good at that, but Athene Karras, Ed Jacobs, all the people that did the PR stuff there, they had full confidence and energy in their tires, their engineers, their company, and Busby Racing. And when somebody, when they had an idea to somehow get themselves some more publicity, they didn't hesitate. And remember, there was two different budgets. There was the budget that came through the, the racing 
part, which was Gary Pace, and then there was the PR budget, which was separately funded. And when they had a little dough in the bank, they spent it. And we'd go to Europe and race, and we should have been nobody, but we'd go to Monza and win a thousand kilometer race in our very first race. And we got more press than anybody there because they got there early and they figured out who they needed to get in bed with. And we'd go to England and test the car and they'd get an English race driver to come out to Silverstone and we'd give them some laps in the car. And so they always were on the cutting edge of getting that logo. And if you look at every one of those pictures from the cockpit with that camera that was more than my best friend in the cockpit, I couldn't see shit out of the right side of the car. (laughs) And and if I bent my head over too far in a corner, I hit the camera, and it wasn't a lot of fun. But what did you see every time that thing was on? You saw that logo in the center of the 962 dash that said BF Goodrich. And so they just knew what to do. And they knew that because of their – look, they'd done cameras in off-road racing because that was kind of their bailiwick. So they kind of knew how to make them live. And they brought in some of the guys that did off-road work for them and everything else. And they'd come to our shops in Laguna and start hanging this shit all over the car. (laughs) And and I'd start looking at it and saying, let's see, 13 pounds there, 9 there, 2 there. The battery, where's the battery going to be? It's going to be right there. I said, no, it's not. If it's there, it'll be under my feet by the third lap. You don't understand what happens inside (laughs) this car. And... And we, but we worked it out, and and it turned out to be some pretty damn good stuff. Because I'm on Facebook and have thousands of friends that I never thought would have ever cared shit about my life at this stage, I get people sending me stuff, and I get film clips taken by those cameras that somebody recorded somewhere, and they send them to me, and I watch them, and I think, God. It, it's not even crude. It, the way we produced it was crude. But the, for the result, the picture, the film was damn good. Oh, yeah. Um, there's one in particular that I think is the Watkins Glen Six Hour. And it might have been me and Mass, and I think we were second, and, and maybe should have won, but I don't know what happened. But anyway... Uh, I, the film they filmed I think it was called Hidden Heroes <clears throat> and it was taken the footage was about 50% in car and 50% in the pit lane and the Hidden Heroes were the guys working on the car and it made a great story and they had produced a film with me narrating it the Ma in 82 and then again in 84 that is still on YouTube and is played over and over and over to hundreds of thousands of hits. And I get people writing me and saying, oh my God, I saw this film. And I I watch the film and think, God, who is that amateur kid that doesn't know what the (laughs) fuck he's talking about? (laughs) And, but anyway, I, that's what they did. So remember, it was two different departments. And if BF Goodrich was trying to support a blimp and, build college stadiums and do whatever they're doing. B.F. Goodrich raced. They did off-road racing. They did every, you know, parking lot racing. Uh, and they finally came to me and said, you won Le Mans for us in 82. I said, Porsche won Le Mans for you in 82. I was a passenger on that deal. That car was a fucking rocket and yeah. twice as fast as any 924 ever should have been. I was going down the straight with the 962s. <laughs> and uh, I said, if you ever want to get somebody that knows how to really cheat, go to Porsche. <laughs> so anyway, they said, now we're ready to move on. I said, wait, no, you don't go from a 924 win at, at Le Mans on street tires to slicks and so on. Oh, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to use street tires. I said, excuse me, you're going to do sports car racing on street tires. I remember yeah, just shaking are. my head thinking, we did. oh, you poor. I know, but I just think we you did poor man. <laughs> and I finally kept coming in and saying, okay, okay, shave another quarter inch off of them. And finally, by the end of the day, I'd say, okay, are we slicks yet? Because as soon as we are, we can go. <laughs> and I said, 
Now all you need to do is take that same tire that we shaved all the tread off of and make it softer, a lot softer. And they did, and we eventually got... So the fun thing, Jim, is that you have these in-car cameras now that are great from a promotional standpoint. We saw some uh, phenomenal driving also oh, yeah. demonstrated as you were alluding to on the tire front um there might have been a little bit of work to be done there as well uh, what do you recall from the the general i guess inclusion of the cameras and how whether it was just a, a good promotional thing or were there any concerns that you know if we're not being up front and succeeding that Maybe we don't want to be showing this from the inside. I'm not sure uh, what the mindset would have been. Well, B.F. Goodrich didn't care. Hmm. B.F. Goodrich had the Don Perdome approach to publicity. I don't give a shit what they're saying as long as they're talking. And Don Perdome told me that back when I was drag racing and ran into him. And You know, he was he was a guy kind of like a Waukenshaw guy where he had a reputation. You know, he, he'd... he'd ruffle feathers and say a few wrong things and guys that take swings at him and but you know he he was the winner and one of the greatest racers that ever lived you know i never thought there was any difference between an aj foyt and a don perdome they mm. both win the same way they both feel the same way they both talk the same way and so on and so forth and it, you, if you're a winner in one discipline in racing then you're just like the guys in the other disciplines i really believe that i've never seen it to be any different so when B.F. Goodrich decided to do things that exposed and maybe made him look vulnerable, I don't think it did at all. Hmm. I think it just said, hey, we're here, you know, there, there's the picture. And remember that a lot of other people enjoyed it, too, because when early on when we had cameras and couldn't win because of our tires, others got shown on our TV cameras winning. So everybody loved it. IMSA loved it. Uh, Nissan loved it. Jaguar loved it. Everybody loved it. Porsche loved it. You know, it, so BF Goodrich became really, really, really high profile and was liked by everybody. Everybody. I think I got a call once a week in my office asking me about, hey, do you think we should go with Yoast or blah, blah, blah. They're all contacting us. I said, look, <clears throat> understand this. This is about money, and they they want you to sponsor them. If you feel that you've got budget over and above what you spend on us, then keep spending more on us because you're not winning yet. Sure. And if you go to them and start losing, you're going to get a bad reputation. So, and they did that. So, but after that, after our successes, they began. I don't know if you realize this, but they began even while we were still racing the 962s. They began to produce a tire for Roush. And ran it on a few, uh, and I think it was Trans Am or maybe GTO yep, yep. or one of those things. And they started sneaking into that area. They're not scared. They are not scared. And they were happy to win in front of everybody, and they were happy to what they called learn in front of everybody because learning is losing and fixing it. So looking at uh, some great stuff that I found in an issue of Imps Arrow about this, uh, was really blown away by the activation of what BFG did with this. So looking at this note in uh, Arrow, mentioned that there was a large 30 by 50 foot traveling display tent that housed yes. a replica 962, uh, et cetera, yes. et cetera. And they had uh, within that big uh, display tent, uh, they had four big TV monitors that received the signals transmitted during the race from your cars. Again, today, today this is meaningless. Uh, you know, this is just standard stuff. But back then, brother, this was space age type stuff in terms of not only a sponsor activating, but dedicating a huge tent for fans and guests where you get to ride along and watch from inside a car. I, I don't think that had been done before. No, it hadn't. But remember that ESPN didn't pay anything for it. BF Goodrich paid for everything and then they bought commercials. So they not only funded the entire film, the camera project and built the tent and, and the spectator 
thing and gave away those little paper hats that we gave away the entire time we were racing. They had a tremendous following by the public. ESPN saw that too. And remember that ESPN didn't pay for that. BF Gerdes did. They paid for the camera installations. They made everything work. And all, and so when the signal went out on ESPN, they just picked it up in the tent. So they took the feed and played it live in the tent that was going to your television in San Francisco. So you were seeing real time because they just they just picked the feed up. And yet it didn't cost ESPN anything. I think CBS, ESPN, there was two or three different people, even NBC, I think, at one point. Uh, but BF Goodrich paid for everything. Wow. Another thing that I love here, and it, it I, I will just interpret this as trying to say positive things uh, when asked instead of maybe telling the full story here. Uh, there's a great entry when asked, BFG driver Jim Busby, uh, of what he thought about the in-car camera. He replied, I've never even caught it out of the corner of my eye. Uh, <laughs> That's a lie. That's a lie. So here, here, yeah. here's some of the fun stuff, though. Uh, so was in doing a little bit of research for this, and, and again, having watched the in-car feeds back when they were live, I mean, I loved them back then. It's just fun reaching out to try and get a little bit of detail now as a reporter. And uh, one of the folks that works at BSI, Doug Parr, he actually uh, replied in an email and told me that, hey, I actually installed one of these cameras in one of Jim's cars at Riverside in 85. Uh, yep. He says it was, the footage was used for TNN's American Sports Cavalcade. But That's true. I asked him, tell me about the difference since he's doing this today as well with in-car cameras. He said, well, today's cameras, everything, not just the physical camera itself, the wires, the be just everything associated with the system weighs about four, four and a half pounds. It's true. And uh, for what you guys had, at least this very first attempt, uh, I think 13 plus pounds is what was quoted here, knowing that there was the camera one that could zoom and yep. pan a little bit, plus yep. there was one in the tail. Right. Any thoughts on, you know, you're lugging around some extra weight. We know you don't want that in a race car. Were you able to take that out with ballast, or did you just live with it? We lived with it because, remember, if I lug that around, I get to lug around a little more money. Mm. I mean, it was just simply economics. I, what am I going to tell them? No. Then they're going to say, well, you know, we, that's what we want, and pretty soon I'm going to beef with the people that are writing the checks. No, we just did it. And and he, he, remember this, that BF Gurdish never asked us to do anything that we hadn't tested. So when this gentleman, I forgot what his name was, came out to Riverside and made that installation, that was a test. Doug Parr, yeah. Yeah, so we're there tire testing. And in doing so, we're camera testing, we're battery testing, we're picture testing. They're, when I'm stopping to talk to the engineers about the tires, there's somebody coming in the other door and messing around with the camera and and readjusting that, rerouting the wires and everything. And I did see it out of the corner of my eye. And I can remember a f once or twice it was terribly annoying because I'd be in a race with somebody and go to look over there and couldn't see out of the side window. So it would almost be like being in an Indy car and having a piece of cardboard that somebody stuck on the side of the uh, along the window all the way to the front so you have no I couldn't see the mirror I couldn't see the mirror I couldn't see the car that was beside me so that did annoy me now going straight ahead and looking straight ahead you forget about it after a while it's almost like I don't know if you're as old as I am but if you're old as me you get those black dots in your eyes oh yeah and you, and you go to the doctor and the doctor says oh don't worry about it your brain will cancel them in a while they'll always be there it was the same thing. I mean, pretty soon you're used to that thing there and you don't think about it anymore until you go and turn and look that way. <laughs> and there's no window and there's no mirror. Yeah. So that was really the only time I ever remember being annoyed by it. Wait, didn't care. They paid the bills. Another thing that I love from this 85 IMSA Aero piece, you were talking about it's uh, the camera's ability to act as a tattletale. 
Um, and so there's a great one where you said it busted you in Miami. And the anecdote here is while you're going for a fast lap and qualifying, yeah. you came up with another. You came up on another car. You said I came Al, up to pass him. Uh, yeah. and Al Leon. There we go. And he locked his brakes and started to go sideways. I kind of hit him, pushed him out of the way, and continued <laughs> to set my best lap. But when I returned to the pits, the crew asked me if anything had happened. I said no. I just got close to the other car, but no problem. <laughs> What I didn't realize is that the camera was showing the action on the huge, uh, huge display screen on Biscayne yeah. Boulevard, and right. everyone had seen the incident. Right. Everyone. Yes. Um, and, and and to me, I, you know, I was pretty heads up driver, but occasionally when somebody would annoy me, I'd move them out of the way. Peter Gregg and I had more ran into each other more often than any two drivers in the history of IMSA, and in four of the five races that I won against Peter where he finished second, I had pushed him out of the way to win. <laughs> in the fifth race, he pushed me out of the way to win. So I still held the upper hand in, in crashing into guys to move them. But <clears throat> you, sometimes you got to move guys. And poor Al Leon, I love the guy. He and his brother, really great guys. And they had a march, I think it was. Yep, yep. And they were in the way. And I was, uh, I was humping. I mean, it was a good lap. Everything was right. Tires were warm. The intercooler was going to be hot. The dry ice on the intercooler was only good for about a lap and a half. And I thought, okay, well, he's got to go. I thought he'd pull over and he tapped the friggin' brakes. And I don't know whether he meant to slow down to get out of my way or whether he didn't even know I was there or he thought the corner was a lot sooner than it was. It didn't matter to me. I went up the inside. I touched him, just touched him on the uh, left left rear uh, panel of his car, and it spun him around, and I went by. And uh, I didn't think too much about it. It's almost like it was part of the lap, and, and I remember being asked about it, and then I was told by Gary Pace, who was the BF Goodrich guy, he said, well, maybe you need to rethink your statement on that, because here you are hitting the guy and knocking him out. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to see the replay, sir? Fine, <laughs> <Right>. sir. <sighs> well, well I, I I might have also said, well, now I vaguely really recall or something like that. Some legal answer. Yes, I don't yes. Uh, I do not, I do not uh, recollect, yeah, but, right. but possibly maybe. Well, right. what, uh, I guess, another kind of what comes to mind question to close here, Jim, but, uh, uh -huh. again, how cool to think that, you know, with IMSA now aligning with NBC Sports, NBC was also big. I know on the IndyCar side back in the yeah. day, uh, with uh -huh. in-car in camera and such. Big yes. new, big new TV partnership here for the series. We're hoping it's going to restore some of its uh, popularity and growth. But yeah. uh, tell me thoughts about you know winding the clock back to '85 and realizing that your team was uh, the central player in helping to bring in-car footage to North American sports car racing. I guess I would have to think that one through because until you just brought it up, it never occurred to me to that the two fit together. Clearly they do. I think the answer to that is simple. It made really good business sense then. And perhaps one of the reasons that it makes good business sense now is because IMSA struggled. And they've struggled for some time. And they've got somebody in there that's clever enough to put the NBC together, deal together, and NBC has developed their camera work in other series, and lo and behold, it comes back to sports car racing. Um, there's few that will argue that it was one of the first attempts on any level, and when I, wa I love NASCAR. I just love the strategy of it. I've always loved it. I always will love it, so I watch every single race. And it never ceases to amaze me what I see about the race and how strategy plays out and how cars perform and then begin to not perform halfway through a fuel run and so on. And I see it on the camera mm. with my own two eyes. So by the time I'm told by Jeff Gordon or somebody what they think is happening, I've already seen it start to happen. Yeah because I'm watching it on the camera and I love every minute of it. So, and I love the fact that an infraction pit lane infraction is backed up by cameras. It's not uh, somebody saying, eh, that guy's an asshole. Pull him in. It's not going to happen. 
You got cameras on everything. So it makes the drivers more honest. You find you to watch Kevin Harvick move a guy out of the way is artwork. And so to me, when I see what's happening through a camera's eye, I'm not being told what happened. I'm not having a rerun that it may be a little foggy or something like that. I watched it happen. And that is what IMSA has needed all along. And I think they got it with us, but I'm not sure that it held. And I think that if NBC is coming back and using the, their camera skills that they've obviously lo- used in other series, you know, it's going to be really good stuff. Thanks again to Jim for spending some time and also clarifying what might have been a bit of a, uh, a PR-friendly comment about, ah, oh, yeah, don't even notice the camera's there. It's beautiful. Ah, oh, what a wonderful thing to, man, I hate that thing whenever I look to my left because it blocks all my views. And anyways, thanks so much to Jim. He's just a blessing. So hopefully you will uh, get a chance to listen to the longer form version of our discussion, that being on the 1989 30th anniversary of their over all win at Daytona and we're also planning to sit down and hopefully capture hours and hours of other stories he has done so much in this sport uh, and is still incredibly active and is just incredibly awesome too so thanks Jim thanks to you for listening we're gonna have a lot uh, you may have already gotten through a number of of the retro podcast that we have this week, all in honor of IMSA starting its 50th anniversary. So plenty more to come as well. All right, I'm Marshall Pruitt. This is a Marshall Pruitt podcast presented to you by the Justice Brothers and Cooper Tires. Thank you for listening. <laughs>